It seems today that all you see is famous peoples in movies and UMass Sports on TV. Hello everybody and after our mid-semester break, welcome into UMass Sports Weekly, your number one source for all things UMass Sports. I'm your dashing host, Tommy Caludi, and we got a great show for you today. First, the football team took on Louisiana Tech, and boy, did that not go well. Liam Rose is going to come in and break that down and tell you just how much the Minutemen need to improve if they want to keep competing and stay in Division I. After that, Liam Burns is going to come on and talk about the women's soccer team, who has been skidding of late. Hopefully, Liam can shine some light on that, illuminate things, and make it so we can understand what their issues are. After that, Alex Francisco comes in to talk about the unbeaten in their last five games men's soccer team. However, you're going to find out unbeaten may have more meaning than what you think. After that, to finish off the show, yours truly wipes off the dust, picks up his new hockey stick, joins that other seat, and starts breaking down the UMass hockey team who started the season two weeks ago. Two games against Colorado College. What will I say? What will I do? Stay tuned to find out. we got a great show coming up. Victor Cruz is queued up, and this is UMass Sports Weekly. This is UMass Sports Weekly. And there's our audience. Now, the UMass football team took on Louisiana Tech at Gillette Stadium this weekend, another, another quasi-home game. Game started off well, very back and forth, and then things fell apart. They lost 56 to 28. You did not hear me wrong, 56 to 28. I'm here with our very own Liam Rose. So Liam, first, after a game like this, when you lose, again, 56 to 28, things need to change. Just baseline perspective, what does this team need to improve upon most? Well, I think it all comes down to defense. And they I think you're right. A couple of turnovers in this game, but you're not going to win any football games when you're allowing 700 yards of offense. They haven't held a team to under 400 yards since week three against Florida International, and they've allowed 35 or more points in three of the past four weeks, all of which they've lost. Now, Liam, obviously when you give up 700 yards and 56 points, you're not going to win. I believe Henderson was his name, receiver for um, Louisiana Tech. Five touchdown receptions? Yes, Carlos Henderson, 12 receptions, 326 yards, and all five touchdown receptions thrown by Higgins on the day. Now, I'm no defensive scheme expert, but I, I think logic would dictate maybe a double or triple team him. It seems like it wasn't maybe the case. Well, it seemed like in this game the entire secondary couldn't stop him. That's definitely the case. You're definitely right there. Now. Liam, the past couple of weeks we've had the debate, Ford or Comis, who's in at quarterback? It seems like that's been settled the past two games. Ford's put up respectable numbers this game. He threw for 268 yards and three touchdowns. But Liam, as you can see, they're not winning games. So I want to know, how much better does Andrew Ford need to be and how much better can he be? Well, for a young quarterback, Andrew Ford has pretty solid numbers with a 64% completion percentage, 13 touchdown and eight picks on the season. But especially in the following game this past weekend, he was sacked seven times and lost 27 yards on the ground. So it's fair to say he would probably contribute from better pass protection in front of him. Now, on top of pass protection, is there anything Ford can do, maybe move the ball downfield, get the running game more involved, or is this just a team that's running in place right now? Well, it seems like every week there's a different receiver stepping up, so Ford continues to find his guys and then maybe the backs are able to establish a lead role there, then that'll help the offense as a unit. Definitely the two-headed monster of Marquise, Lung and Marquise Young excuse me, and Sakai Lindsay have been good this year. Definitely put up decent numbers. So it, it seems like everything is falling on the defense at this point. Now, Liam, in this game, 56 to 28, you don't think that there's a lot of opportunities for UMass to win. That wasn't the case, though. Tell us about the missed opportunities and how big those were, how much of an impact they had on this game. Well, we addressed UMass's biggest weakness in this game was its defense, and at the same time, it was also one of the biggest strengths as the defense forced four fumbles in the game, three of which were covered, but unfortunately, the offense couldn't consistently capitalize on the Bulldogs' mistakes. Now, another important thing to point out, you recover three of the fumbles, can't score. Also, you have two missed field goals. Logan Laurent missed one and the new uh, sophomore kicker that they brought in from New Jersey. Liam, I just want to know from your perspective, is do we have another debate on our hands, or another kicker debate, or is this just testing out a new kicker while phasing out an old one? 
Well, as I said a couple of weeks ago, when it comes down to these position battles, I think the most tangible measure of who is in front is the wins on the board. And this team has one win through seven weeks so far, so I don't think any positions are set. Now, Liam, before I let you go, I just want to know, beating Florida International, not a huge, not a strong program by any stretch of the imagination. Is this team destined to stay in Division One, or are we, are we hitting our heads against a brick wall here? Well, this team, this year especially, is especially young. So they've shown a lot of fight, especially in a couple of tough matchups against Florida, Mississippi State. But with experience, I think they should find success. If not, then hopefully we can find us some better recruits in the next couple of years. Hopefully is the operative word in that sentence. Thank you very much, Liam. Next week, I believe October 23rd, we have a game at McGurk Alumni Stadium against Wagner University, Wagner College. Not really sure who Wagner is or what he wants, but he's either a university or a college. Either way, thank you very much, Liam. When we come right back, we're going to talk about some women's soccer, so stay tuned. As my Spanish professor would say, we move on from football americano to just football. I'm here with Liam Byrne to talk about some women's soccer. We, like I said, we've taken a week off, and uh, it almost seems like the women's soccer team has taken a week off. Not a lot of wins, not a lot of success. Now, Liam... We've been gone for a week. I just want you to give me a recap. Tell us what's going on with this team. Yeah, Tommy, totally. I mean, you're probably right. It did seem like these girls did take a whole week off. Now, let's start here on October 6th uh, against George Mason. Uh, it was a loss, 2-1 uh, to one in double overtime, and uh, where we had Jenna Thomas who scored on our free kick attempt in the 52nd minute. Uh, good for the men and women right there. And then uh, George Mason just fired back. Uh, Alex Myers scored in the 69th minute, and then in overtime, the, these women love to play in overtime, which we'll they get to later. They do love to play in overtime. <laughs> which we'll get to later. They won in the 107th minute. Now, on to uh, the next game they had on October 9th against George Washington was just a flat-out loss for them. They got shut out uh, in the first half, really, because George Washington scored both their goals in the first half, and then UMass was outshot 11-9, uh, but UMass had the advantage on the corner kicks, which was 8-4. And then October 10th, it's not up on the, on the uh, screen right now, but I want to recognize the, um, the women's soccer team for winning the NC, NSCAA College Team Academic Award. Uh, there you which, go. Yeah, Academics so always important. Doing on the, on the field and off the field. You're telling me they good. beat the University of Alabama? No, I don't think they beat the University of Alabama. Academic-wise? I'm, I'm not sure entirely, um, but... I don't know, maybe. I, don't, I didn't look too much into it, but <laughs> the GPA uh, comes from uh, last year's team, which was a 3.34, and to be eligible for it, you have to have a 3 0. Ed Matz is uh, that's his 12th team out of the 13 years he's been coaching, both UMass and Northeastern, to, uh, to have the award. And then we got two more games that, uh, that UMass lost or either tied. Uh, October, Indulge me. Yes, yes. October 13th uh, against Davidson was a loss. One nothing in overtime, and then our girl Cassidy Babin had five saves in that one, uh, and UMass outshot Davidson 17 to 15, but could not get the win in overtime. And finally, the most recent game, October 16th, against at Rhode Island, was a tie uh, in double overtime. And Jackie Miller, first career goal as a redshirt junior here uh, on the Minute Women's squad in the 52nd minute. Um, each team had 21 shots apiece, and UMass had more corners than Rhode Island, Tommy. So, Liam, a lot of information to take in right there, but what I want to look at, we talk about close games, and mm -hmm. we've talked about this trend of overtime losses, close losses, end of game, tie game, going into the 90th minute losses. And I mean, what can the Minute Women do to capitalize on this trend? What can they do to fix these late game losses other than perhaps a rain dance? Yeah, you know, I, I keep becoming a broken record here, and I, I hate to do it with this team because they have so much talent, and, and it's very well known that they do have talent because in the past two seasons, you know, they've really been fighting tough. And uh, with the games decided within one or two goals here, um, last season was eight, and then this season is already eight. So we have four more games left in the A-10, uh, I mean, in the regular season. So right there, it's, it's, it's tough to, in the whole season last year, it was eight. You know, and now, now it's already at eight with four games left, and the next four games could be decided by one or two goals. And then after that, um, games decided in extra time, you know, last year was six, and then this year is already five. So like I said, it could be even more in the last four games. And then games ending in a draw were three last year and just two this season and just recently uh, this past weekend against Rhode Island, Tommy. But what they need to do is just focus on what, 
you know, every soccer team needs to focus on is just getting the ball in the back of the net. I know it sounds simple, uh, but their defense is firing on all cylinders um, with Cassidy Babin and company. Um, so I think they just really need to, to keep pressing and to keep trying to get the ball in the back of the net. They have a lot of opportunities, a lot of missed opportunities, but they just need to capitalize on the opportunities. And before we move on, Liam, I just want to know really quickly, you, the defense is running on all cylinders. Mm -hmm. I mean, do we need a change in scheme on offense, or do we just need to close our eyes, bury our head down, and just kick? I think it's that one. I think go all, you know, hold the bar on it and uh, just try and get the ball as close to the net as possible because they're they're going there. You know, they're, they're you know going off the crossbars and, and just missing, or the goalie just makes a great save. But it's got to keep pressing on offense. So, Liam, we only have three games left in the season. Where do you see this Minute Women team ending up when we get towards the end of October? You know, we have four more games, um, three of which are at home. They're at home here at, uh, at Rudd Field. So, I mean, the, the home record doesn't really go by uh, <laughs> what, what we see on the field. But uh, as you can see there, uh, Duquesne, VCU, St. Joe's, and Dayton. Uh, Duquesne and VCU are – Possible wins for the Minute Women. Uh, I'm not trying to bank on anything because they haven't been playing well as of late. Uh, St. Joe's is a top two team in this conference, and they, they look very good this season. And uh, Dayton at Dayton is always a tough game uh, for these Minute Women. So I don't see them bearing too well, uh, especially because they're second to last place here in, in the A-10 conference. And it, it, every team in the A-10 makes it. Um, but... With, with the competition they have coming up and, uh, and towards the end of the season, I, I'm not too promised that the, these women will, uh, will go far in the A-10 tournament. Despite all of that, you heard three home games coming up in the next four. Go out, support the team. Mm -hmm. Thank you very Absolutely. much, Liam. We'll get you all the updates you need on the team as they go forward and head into that A-10 tournament. When we come back, Alex Francesco comes on, and we're going to talk about the men's soccer team, who is undefeated in their last five games. So definitely stay tuned for that. And welcome back into the show. Last Wednesday, the Minuteman soccer team took on St. Bonaventure. Our very own Alex Francisco was there with the story. And the person who made that video is right here with me, Alex Francisco. Alex, thanks for coming in. So, you have this win against St. Bonaventure. We don't really need to go over that because you just did in the video. And then you tie against Davidson 1-1. I've been alluding to it all show. Minutemen are unbeaten in their past five games. Tell me why that stat is deceiving. You know, they are unbeaten, great feat to have, but there are definitely a few ties thrown in there. Um, you know, they haven't been playing at a very high level of soccer right off the bat. Um, they, have, they haven't had any first half goals since their loss at Vermont over a month ago. So I think the problem is coming out into the game with just the lack of urgency you see there. But um, four games left in the regular season, Time really flies when you're having fun like we are here. Oh, yeah. We always have fun here. But uh, I we, think... I, I love my job. You know, these next four games are going to be a great way to create some momentum to go into A-10 playoffs. So, Minutemen are in a very good place. I believe third in the A-10 right now. Is that correct? That's not correct. That is not correct. Where are they? They are... They fall lower at, like, seventh. Seventh. Okay. I don't know where I got that. It was incorrect. But I'm a good journalist, so I corrected myself on air. I apologize. I am not Brian Williams. So, Alex, next four games, you just talked about it before we go into A-10 play. Always important to build up momentum. Right. Just go into those four games for me and tell us what, what we need to know about them. Yeah, we're going to see URI. They're 4-6-3 and three overall, 5th in A-10. That'll be a very close game. That will be a great test for this team, as well as when they see VCU. Um, four, six, and three. The test is going to be that third game against George Washington. They are third in the A-10. Oh, that's, Seven, yep. three, and five right now. Um, so in order to really do well in these games, I don't think they can continue to play the way they have been. Definitely true. When you don't score in the first half, you tend to have difficulty picking up that slack in the second half. But if you're like the Patriots this week, you take the first half off and then you blow the red rifle and the Bengals out. Either way, Alex, something's got to give, something has to change. In your opinion, what needs to improve with this team? Like I said originally, this team starts every game flat-footed, sloppy passing. They're not passing to feet. They're just really playing kick-and-run soccer. Um, 
no tempo or rhythm to their style of play. They're second to last in the A-10 right now in taking shots. Unacceptable. Um, that being said, they are fifth in saves and fourth in shutouts, which is impressive. I credit to that to the defense really keeping this team alive. Um, that's all on the shoulders of, or the hands rather, of George Bracera, goaltender. He's a huge factor in this. He's very vocal with this team, always communicating with his defense, making sure they hold their line, try to catch the other team off sides. Reminds me of a Manny Neuer-esque presence, a sweeper keeper, if you will. But Very nice comparison. Yeah, you know. Um, really I, pulled that one up. <laughs> I understand the defensive strategy going into games with a high defensive presence and then trying to take advantage of the few opportunities you get on the counterattack. I understand it. It's how my own... Um, native Portugal team just won the Euro Cup but this defense is not impenetrable um, I'd like to see this offense really come alive the next few games before a 10 playoffs start so Alex I just want to finish up you just heard me and Liam talk about how the women's soccer team needs to start scoring to complement their defense is it your assertion that this defense isn't good enough to carry this team or do you think a more necessary balance is needed if they want to keep having success yeah, I, it's definitely they need more balance. This defense has been doing a great job because while they haven't been scoring any second half goals, they haven't been letting or scoring any first half goals. They haven't been letting up that many either. Um, it's really the defense keeping this team alive, and I think the offense needs to just pull some more weight. I think this would be an excellent team if they could just get um, a natural goal scorer, striker presence on it. And I honestly, I don't know if we have that right now. Well, you, have what we, you know what we don't have, you know what we have, and put that together, you have what UMass is. So hopefully this team can compete in the A-10, finish out strong these last four games, and make a run as they did last year. Thank you very much, Alex. Like we said for soccer, you got Babin in the defense, Becerra in the defense. Hopefully those two can ignite and make something special. Now, after the break, we're going to come back and we're going to talk some men's hockey who just started the season two weeks ago. So stay tuned. And welcome back to the show. Obviously, I'm not Tommy, but I'm Liam Byrne here, and uh, we're here to talk some men's hockey with our very own Tommy Kaludi. Tommy. That would be me. Good to see you over there, man. Yeah, nice to see you. How you yeah, been? I've been good. been good. Nice little row reversal we got going on here. Absolutely. So, yeah, we're here to talk some men's hockey. So, this past weekend, or two weekends ago, uh, the UMass hockey team squared off against Colorado College um, with the uh, first game, 3 nothing. Second one uh, was a loss. So, first one, we got the win. But, you know, what happened about those games, Tommy? Tell us a little bit about uh, the team there. So for basic breakdown, what you need to know, first game right off the bat under Coach Carvel, new regime, they come out 3-0 three, uh, three win, great for the Minutemen to start off. What's important to note is new goaltender Ryan Wischow comes in, first start as a Minuteman. Obviously, they have their pregame against Dalhousie, but, or preseason, but this is the first game of the year. Comes in. Nets 30, uh, posts 31 saves, shuts out Colorado College, and just absolutely blows the lid off this team. Hopefully this kid can perform and yep. move on because mm -hmm. this team definitely needs a goalie. For sure. The reason I said that was because I knew I was going to contradict myself <laughs> right after. 7-4 loss. Yep. Obviously not good. Colorado College not the strongest of opponents. However, the issue in this game is the fact that Wischow gets chased in the first period after giving up three goals. This has been an issue for the Minutemen the past three years, almost past four years, I would say. So despite the fact that the offense, three goals, three and four goals in both games is going to be good enough to win games, especially in college hockey, to give up seven, really not going to be good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially against a team like Carl or College, you know, when, you, when you were in one of the toughest conferences in the country, Tommy. Exactly. So, now it, you, you based off you the issues of, of goaltending, but... You can go off more of the goaltending, but what else do you think are some issues that, that are going to be holding back the Minutemen, and how can they, they fix it, and, and what can they do to, to work on that? Uh, I plead with you, Coach Carvel, I really do. Coach Micheletto made this mistake my freshman year, four years ago. Kevin Boyle gets cut, goes to UMass Lowell. He becomes a star goaltender there. Sophomore year, Steve Masterlers comes in. He's pretty much consistent as your starter, and what happens? They have a decent season. Now, junior year, you have Steve Mastelers facing off against Henry Dill. Two goaltenders fighting for a spot. Mastelers has a bad first game, loses 7-1 to BU. Micheletta replaces him next game. Dill plays well. Dill play has a bad game. Mastelers goes in. And you have a chess match back and forth. And then last year, you have Dill 
Alex Wakaluk, and Nick Renyard, who is now a sophomore, fighting for a spot. So, Coach Carvel, I plead with you, you need to pick a goalie. The issue with this is it's all about consistency, mm -hmm. Liam. As a hockey player, you want to know what your team is going out there every night and who you can support, who's going to be behind you and being able to stop the puck. Now, obviously, performance changes from night to night, but that consistency is so important in keeping with the flow of the team, making sure that everything works the way it should, and I really think goaltending needs to improve. The other thing I want to talk about, like I said, offense is great, but offense started off great last year. Once we got into hockey East mm -hmm. play, yep. that kind of stalled, which means defense is going to be extremely key. I want to highlight William Lagesson, who is a player from Sweden. I was high on him last year. I mean, you have him and Mark Hetnick. Well, I would say you're, you're two big guns on defense. The guys are going to log the most ice time. And what comes with that is the territory of where you're shut down defenders. We're going to be the ones that have to go up against the other team's top line. What really needs to happen with this UMass team, they need defenders that can shut down a top line, and they need goaltenders that can keep everybody else off the board. Whether or not they can do that is still to be seen at this point, but definitely something that has to be considered. Right. So it seems like in, in this whole theme of the show that you know we have a theme of defense you know, with our men and women's soccer team, and even the hockey team. So mm -hmm. I, I like how you touched on consistency because it's tough when, as a player. You know, you, you have three different goalies in three different games. You don't know what, what to expect. Exactly. So, yeah, that's definitely something to key on uh, for this men's hockey team. So, Tommy, just to finish off here, man, um, three key highlights of the season. What, what do you see uh, or what can we look forward to this season uh, for a highly anticipated season because, you know, new coach, new players, Tell us what you got, Tommy. So first thing I want to point out, obviously new coach, new regime. You want to see how Coach Carvel reacts, and you want to see how the team meshes together. Last year, they won games early under John Micheletto. I think they went 7-0, and 7-1, and, mm -hmm. and then things just came crumbling down. You can't have that happen. Now, I would call this a bridge year for the Minutemen. They're very young, brought in a ton of freshmen, aren't graduating a lot of seniors. So it's going to be important to see, not necessarily the wins or losses, but I think it's going to be important to see how this team performs, whether they keep fighting late into the games, whether they keep putting up points, and whether they just decide to bring the fight to games. And th that was the issue last year, and I think if this team shows effort, if they show support behind Coach Carvel, then it's going to be promising for next year. Mm -hmm. Second thing I want to point out, freshman Johnny Lazarus. I know it's early. Lazarus had two goals this weekend against Colorado College. You get guys like him, Kirk Keats and Austin Plevy, sophomores and freshmen, maybe make a line with them. Obviously, replacing Dennis Krevchenko is going to be difficult, but maybe Lazarus could be the guy. You never know. Mm -hmm. Last thing I want to point out, it's a senior year for a couple of uh, this show's favorites, Steven Yakov, Ellis, Ray Pagosi. Those two have been a dynamic duo since their freshman year at UMass when they were on a line with Troy Power. Jakob Ellis is captain. It's difficult, obviously, being a captain under a new coach, but... I think you need to follow Jakob Ellis and Pagosi this season. The way they go is going to be the way the team goes. They can't control goaltending. They can't control defense. But they can control how the offense runs. And if the offense is running, you can bet Jakob Ellis and Pagosi are going to be behind it. Minutemen have a game against Army this weekend. I believe it is at the Mullen Center. Go out and support yes, them. I think this is going to be a, uh, a telling weekend for this team. Definitely, Tommy. Yeah, so go out and support your Minutemen at the Mullen Center against Army at 7 o'clock. And, and like you mentioned, watch Jakob Ellis and, and watch those guys, Ray Bogosi. They've been here for a while. They know the UMass scheme. But like you said, it's going to be tough under a new coach, Carvel. But Tommy, thank you so much. And that will do it for us tonight here from UVC TV. This has been UMass Sports Weekly. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I love saying this because I'm the social media guy. Exactly. So Vine, Snapchat, anything. You know, we're streaming right now live. So, oh, every week. Every single week, we'll be here. So we'll be back next week with all the best in UMass athletics. I'm Liam Byrne, and this is UMass Sports Weekly. See you next week, guys. Peace out.